Perfect. So we're up and running. So this is a presentation of five Java features you didn't know about, and the subtitle is, and it doesn't work, still doesn't work. Number four will shock you. So I don't think so much clickbait in this, but let's see what you think. My name is Per, and it's great to be back in Sweden again. Uh, I lived in California for three years, and being back to my home time, I was born here an undisclosed number of years ago, many more cycles ago, and uh, I did a lot of speak internationally, over 50 talks. I've uh, written a book called Modern Java, and uh, writing for Oracle Java Magazine, Dean Zone, and many other uh, forums. I was one of the starters with Speedment, and uh, well, we go back and forth between Gothenburg and, and Silicon Valley. So, before we start, uh, this, this presentation contains learnings from Speedment Open Source. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that product. I know maybe people think that I'm pushing my, my product, but I learned a lot when, while I was doing this product. And it's totally free, Apache 2 license. You can clone it or use it in whatever way you want. So we give it away, basically. And there is also another portion which is not open source, but there is a free version. So you can try it and kind of kick the tires and think, uh, is this something I can use or not, or similar technologies. Some of the features are a bit advanced, so you might not be able to use every five tip uh, tomorrow. But that's the case. Uh, if it were that simple, maybe it would not be so interesting. I don't know. So without further ado, let's start. So, what is this? It's kind of unimaginable. It's a class called A, with some properties A, B, and C. It doesn't say that much. But actually, some of the objects I work with uh, around Epoch 800 million, which was in the middle of the 90s, look like this. And why would anyone write a class like this? It's totally ununderstandable. Well, the answer is that if you kept your identifiers short, your Java program would run 30% faster than if you used long identifiers. And this was, of course, the time before the JIT compiler. So <coughs> we did this, actually. We had actually programs that kind of swept through all the code and did this to us voluntarily. Uh, but of course, there were comments in inserted, so you can actually read and get a hint what this was about. So actually, this is a person, first name, last name, and social security number. But this is a clear case of sacrificing clarity for performance. We don't want to do that. We want, we want clarity and we want performance at the same time. I mean, imagine what happened when you get a null pointer exception. What would you do? <laughs> You're clueless. And I won't even go there. How about reflection? I mean, totally useless. So let's start out. First tip is objects on the stack. So the problem is like we have this life like here for ordinary Java objects, and we have this cycle. Uh, we would could have this cycle if we could allocate objects on the stack. So this is kind of a long process. You, you have to allocate your object on the heap, which is quite big, maybe 16 gig, gig of data, and you have to find a, a huge uh, spot for your object. You have to use it, and then when it, you don't use it, you have to do garbage collection, and you have to make sure that the object is not referenced by another object. And that's quite, it's even harder than allocating to actually free an object. So wouldn't it be much better to allocate a temporary object on the stack and then just get rid of it automatically? So uh, before I start, I will do a poll. Have you ever allocated Java objects on the stack before? Uh, so, so, uh, just a few. One, we're uncertain that two people have actually done this. Cool, I would ask the same question after my presentation. So let's look at the problem. Here we have a point class, which is a, it's an immutable class, and it has two properties, x and y. We have a constructor, and we have two getters. Nothing fun about that. But there is also a toString method. So let's zoom into that. What does it do? I know that this is no longer the, the recommended way of writing a toString uh, method, but it provides a good uh, means of uh, illustrating the problem. So what we do is that we create a string builder, we use that string builder, and then we convert it to another object, namely a string. So if we really look into this, we see that this string builder here is local to the method. It can't be seen from outside. We never return the string builder. It can't be observed from outside. So this would be a perfect candidate to allocate on the stack, wouldn't it? 
So let's start and create. We create a, a point here, and we have a method called sum, which really iterates a million times and invokes the two-string method, uh, computes the length, and then just do, does the sum of everything. So would this really create a million string builders and a million strings? That is the big question. And the question is, it depends. It depends on whether you can observe these objects from outside. Uh, so this really sounds like quantum mechanics. Uh, is it quantum mechanics? Well, we will see. So uh, we create a main method. We kind of we, we start by cleaning up the heap, uh, from, and we invoke the sum method, and then we wait for a while so that we can expect the actual heap, and then we do the same thing again. So we can expect the heap, what's on the heap, really. So after the first sum invocation, it looks like something like this. So we have actually created <coughs> a large number of strings and a large number of string builders, but not one million, only like 50,000 strings. And after the second invocation, we haven't created any string builds there. And I think the strings that's seen here, they are just the strings that were there from the beginning, holding class names or whatever that's there from the beginning. So that's weird. But it's not so weird if you understand what's going on under the hood. So let's look at this method and again and take into consideration something called escape analysis. Now, escape analysis is something that's done by the Java compiler. Uh, in particular, the C2 compiler does that. So it's able to de deduct that the string builder cannot be observed from outside the method, and it cannot be observed by another thread. Those are the two requirements. So actually, we can't take this Russian uh, Matryoshka doll and put it inside the slightly larger one. So it can be kind of hid, hidden into the other doll. So that's great. So that means that the C2 compiler actually can allocate this object on the, on the stack instead of on the heap. It's possible to do it. So let's take this a step further. Uh, now, the compiler also does something called inlining. Inlining is something that kind of flattens out the code, and it makes uh, code optimization much more efficient because you can look on a wider scope. So with inlining, you can look within the map feature here. If you look at the bottom bottom here, you have map. You take y, i, and then you map it to a string and then to a length. And you will see that the string is local to the map operation. So the string will never escape from this context here. So then we can take the two smallest dolls and put them into the third uh, smallest doll. So that is great news. Now we can allocate both the string and the string build on the stack. Great for, for performance. And if we take the entire application into consideration, we have a point which is immutable, can never change, and point can never change. And this stream only contains uh, fixed numbers, which obviously cannot change. And this lambda inside the map does not change. So in theory, uh, the Java compiler could actually derive that the string length would always be 10. So the result of this would always be 10 million. Uh, I mean, not 10 million, but yes, it will be 10 million in this case, because each uh, length is 10. So in theory, we could end up with one big doll. Uh, now, I know for sure that this is not yet the case, but it could be the case in some distant future. I know there is uh, a work ongoing in Java to be able to kind of uh, evaluate constants, so constants can be replaced more efficiently within the Java code. And this might be an ultimate goal for that. So what happened? Uh, it turns out that after 10,000 calls, the JVM compiled the two-string method. And, and when it was compiled, the old code path was replaced for the new code path, which was compiled. And that took place after about 50,000 calls. So we were running here on the left-hand side with a kind of a commuter train, which is slow. And then a compiler kicked in. And we can switch over to the right-hand side with the express train, which is much faster. OK. And this explains why it was 50,000 objects and not 1 million in the first run. Uh, and it also explains why it was zero objects in the second run because now we are on the fast train and no objects were ever created because they were automatically created on the stack. 
So after all, this was not quantum mechanics, and uh, that's a huge relief, because who understands quantum mechanics anyway? Okay, uh, so stack allocation creates a presentation of an object on heap rather than on off heap, uh, on stack rather than off on heap. Oh. Uh, so the stack objects there are uh, allocated instantly without global memory allocation. Uh, they're inherently cleaned up when the method exit, exit. We just pop the stack pointer and the object disappears uh, intrinsically. Inherently, and they can be simpler than the heap counterparts, so they don't have to contain all the bells and whistles of an ordinary Java object. Doesn't have to have synchronization. Doesn't have to have a class pointer, for example. And one other cool feature is that uh, since it can't be observed by another thread, the compiler can actually remove all synchronization uh, statements. So if I would have used a string buffer here instead of a string builder. Uh, you might know that the string buffer is the synchronized version of the string builder. Those synchronization can be optimized away and yielding more performance. So actually, the object looks like something which is not really, but it's more efficient. Uh, and also a good thing with the stack is that with a probability almost uh, to one, uh, the elements on the stack will be in the CPU cache because it, they use the, the, the stack all the time. Uh, and it's the C2 part compiler that performs escape analysis, so you have to make sure you run in server mode. Otherwise, you don't get the benefits from, from this feature. And it can kick, kick in after about 10,000 invocations. Uh, Java collects statistics on each call, so it will gather those statistics, and after 10,000 calls, it will invoke the actual compiler. Uh, but it depends a little bit uh, when the compiler is invoked, depending on what Java version and a lot of other features, which is outside the scope of this presentation. Uh, escape analysis with inlining can span over several call levels, what we just saw. This is an important thing. Overriding finalize prevent stack allocation. Why is that? Why can an object that has finalized over it and never be allocated on the stack. Someone? Because the thread that runs finalize runs on another thread and my thread, and thus it is observable by another thread, and thus it cannot be inlined with the, with the uh, stack allocation. So that is yet another reason to stay away from finalize because it's a heavy performance penalty. It allows Scala re uh, CPU register representation of, for example, integer and long. So you, they, you don't have to have them uh, on the stack, you can even have them in registers. But that's up to the compiler, of course. Uh, and this explains why it's cheap to return an optional. If you have a variable and just wrap it in an optional, you might think that, oh, I have to create uh, an object every time I return. But that's not really the case, because usually they just get optimized away. And it's just a syntactic notion of what's going on. Same thing with streams. Uh, streams kind of rely on uh, escape analysis, because uh, you have a lot of object floating around, and you apply lambdas on this stream of operation. And if you would have been able to, if you had to create each and every object on this, the heap, they would be very slow. And there is a new Graal VM. Uh, anybody have used Graal VM here? No one. Shocking. <laughs> it's a new compiler for, for Java, which, uh, which has the C2 compiler completely written in Java itself. And it has a much better inlining, and, and it has a huge performance benefit over the normal JVM. So uh, the more advanced the C2 compiler get, the better our code will run for free. And it promotes local abstraction. So we have like code clarity and performance without compromise. So that was the first tip. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to uh, switch back and forth. Normally I'll see my presentation here. So I will poll again. How many of you have run Java and invoked the same method more than 10,000 times? Well, then you have used stack allocation. Good to know. OK, proper performance testing. That's the next step. Uh, I'm going to talk about something called micro benchmark, and in particular, something called JMH, which is Java Micro Harness, Micro Benchmark Harness. 
And it's kind of benchmarks is kind of another dimension of unit tests, but they test performance instead of actual functionality. So that can allow you to fail early. If you write something that's inefficient, your test will fail. Or, and you can assert that future versions will be performance, so that could be a part of the regression test to test the performance of your code. And it can be used to reproduce problems. Maybe some reports that, oh, while I run this, it's slow, and you have no clue why. And it's also good for exploration, because uh, it's kind of non-obvious what's performant and what's not performant in Java. I think you heard uh, the rule number one, don't optimize, and rule number two, don't optimize now. And uh, this is something you learn when you, you, you do benchmarks. So let's start a uh, humble beginning. Uh, I'm going to make another poll now. Uh, who of you have used system current millisecond time to benchmark your code? Almost everybody. I'm, I'm guilty as charged too. This has a lot of problems, of course, because you have no clue if your process are running. The time is ticking, the wall clock time is ticking, but your process might not run. So it kind of can give you a useless result. Another problem is that uh, current time milliseconds can be adjusted by network protocols like time adjustment. So actually, uh, this can complete in a negative time. If we, have, we were very unlucky and the time was adjusted while we ran the test, it can execute in negative time. And that, of course, is not really good. <laughs> So we did a little bit of improvement. We used something called nanotime instead, which in theory gives you one million time higher resolution and doesn't give you the problem of uh, the time might be jumping back and forth. But we still have the same problem that we have no clue what's going on. Maybe the compiler is compiling what I just show you, or maybe our process is just sw uh, swapped out or doesn't run on the Linux system. And there is another advantage. You have to make sure that your test uh, completes in less than 292 years. Otherwise, the, it will wrap around. So keep that in mind. OK, uh, so what can JMH do? Uh, well, it can handle our load. Uh, it can use, have different traffic models that you can use for free. You have, don't have to construct them by yourself. It can el eliminate statistical noise. Uh, of course, if you run a benchmark just one time, there might be some jitter. But if you run it a million times, uh, it's much more obvious that you have a better result. It allows for warm-up. Uh, as I explained, the C2 compiler kicks in after a while. And uh, of course, th the JMH will give you kind of a warm-up period. So you will make sure that everything is warmed up before you do actual benchmark on it. And it also avoids um, false uh, code optimization. So maybe you write a test, but the compiler is so smart that it will see that your, your code doesn't return anything. So it will just optimize everything away. And you think that, wow, well, I, I wrote something super fast, but actually it never ran. And that's kind of a disappointment when you deploy them in a real-time scenario. So this is, for example, a black hole. It turns out it's really, really tricky to force the Java uh, virtual machine to actually do something uh, with a guarantee. So this shows something that consumes a number of tokens. Long is the number of tokens you have to consume. This is just a way of producing some kind of work with the CPU. So you can see that we start off with having some kind of volatile long that we just set to some random value. And we compute a lot of things. And then we see if that computation is 42. It's very, very unlikely that it is 42 because it's 2 to the power of 64. Uh, so the likelihood is almost zero, that it's 42. But it can't be uh, ruled out. And because of that, we know that the computer needs to really do this. So that's cool. And we also need to set the value. Because if you haven't set the value, the compiler will optimize it away. So this shows how tricky it is to really be sure that something is done. And all these things are taken care of by JMH. So let's look at some benchmark code. Uh, we have here uh, something called int stream which will return a stream of, say, a million ints. And then we will just uh, accumulate them in three different ways. We will use an atomic long, a long adder, and a, and a custom class that we have written ourselves called, called accumulator, ACC for short. And the accumulator just looks like this. So it just holds the sum. And it can be merged with another ac um, accumulator, and it can return the sum. 
And these, of course, will be optimized away and allocated on the stack, as we learned in the previous tip. And this is another example of how a black hole can be used. To, uh, actually, JMH provides a black hole for us here. And by using that black hole, we are sure that this is really executed. Another way of making sure it's being executed is to return a value. So here we use both the methods. So let's see here, uh, we can also do a parallel test. We just insert parallel for the streams, and we can see how they perform while processing parallel streams. Uh, I want to point out that each of and every me method returns a value, and that's important, otherwise they'd be just optimized away. So you start the benchmark, it will take quite a long time, several minutes usually. And it will do a warm-up iteration, maybe five times, and then we do the actual iteration, and then we'll uh, collect all those results and present them in this way. And you can do some fancy graph. There are tools on the internet. You can just uh, take a JSON file and insert it and get nice charts. I've done my own charts here. And you can see the performance of the different alternatives here, where lower is better. So this shows the actual execution time, the number of milliseconds per operation. In this case, it was, uh, I don't know how many integers, but a large number of integers. So we can see that we have the accumulator uh, was pretty fast. And when we did parallel, it was even faster. The adder wasn't that fast, but still fair. And with parallel, it became much faster. And the atomic was pretty fast, but when we do, did uh, parallel, the performance was uh, terrible. And this is the first shocker, actually. And why is atomic, uh, why is atomic long uh, poor for parallel? Let's look at the code again. Why is atomic long slow in parallel applications? It's because all the threads will get contended, contend about the resources. It only has one way of entering into the synchronized portion. Actually, it's not synchronized, but one way to... One thread can only be there at the same time, so all thread will kind of spin weight to access the values, and so it will perform much worse when it's parallel. Okay, so micro benchmarks, don't do clocks, do benchmark, outsmart the JVM, return a value or consume it. And one lesson here, if we want to collect a stream, you can have a lock-free divide and conquer parallel immutable objects, which is very scalable in terms of number of CPUs. Great. Third, short circuit streams for massive performance gain. So let's say we have a complicated stream and we are at A and we want to get to B. Wouldn't it be nice to do this instead of following the maze? Of course, the answer is yes, but how? So let's look at the problem. Let's look at this list. We have a list of three elements, A, B, C. And if we want to compute the size of that list, it's trivial. We just invoke size. And that has a complexity that's not dependent on the number of elements we have in the list. So it's order one. It doesn't matter if it's three elements or three billion elements. It will return the value immediately. But if we create a stream and count the number of elements in the stream, we have a problem because the complexity of that operation is proportional to the number of elements in the stream. And that is kind of not good. But it doesn't have to be that. So if we look at uh, a SQL query, for example, a SQL query is something called a declarative construct, meaning that it says what we want to have, but it doesn't say how the database is to compute this result. It says that we want to count all the film, film elements that satisfy this requirement that we have this predicate. But of course, the database is free to use an, an index or use a pre-computed value or use whatever means it has. Or it might just fall back to just iterating over each and every film and count them. We don't know that. But it's likely that we'll use an index. The same is true for stream. Actually, the first statement, films a stream, creates a stream that is a representation of a stream with all elements. And the next statement, filter, returns another stream that only contains those films that satisfies this requirement. PG-13 here is a, a kind of rating that the American Movie Association does. So 
that stream doesn't have to iterate by definition over all the elements. It can be another stream that only iterates over a subset of the elements. And we don't know that. That's hidden in the stream implementation. So we kind of have these two different views. Is the stream a kind of glorified iterator? Or is it a source-aware stream that really knows something about its source? So let's look at the solution. Maybe I want to implement my own list. So I can do like this. I have a list and I implement my own version of stream that returns my list stream. And my list stream overrides count. And instead of counting the objects, it returns the size of the original list. So my stream in this case would have an order one operation that will complete regardless in the same speed, regardless of how many elements there are inside the stream. So this is a kind of a smart stream, even though it's very simple. But this only solves one problem, the problem when I invoke count directly on the original stream. What if I have a lot of filters and other things? Then it becomes more uh, tricky. So let's see it another step, step. Let's say if I have a skip operation, which is fairly uh, simple to do. So I have a list, I invoke stream, and I skip the first element, and then I count it. But this is the same as removing the skip operation and replacing the list with a sublist. You see that? So it's, it's the equivalent operation, but we never look at the one we skip. So, and it can be shown by a logic proof that if this is true, if stream count is order one and stream and skip n is order one, then stream skip n count is also order one. And so we can show this with a kind of induction proof that if you kind of fix all the intermediate operations, you can actually get a stream that will be order one regardless of what method you call. This is, of course, very tricky to do. Uh, is this really legal? It is. It's actually been uh, written since Java 9. It's in the documentation that it actually is allowed to uh, remove objects within a stream. So now I'm going to talk about speedment because speedment is uh, about streams. So it can be used to use to view data bus tables as streams, and it renders SQL directly from Java streams. So it's kind of a stream or a so this is an example where we have films, we apply some filters, we sort them in some order, we skip and limit, and then we just print it out, what's ever in the stream. So we select only films that's PG-13, which are longer than an one hour, and then we sort them in a certain order, in length order, and the title reversed, and then we skip to page number three, basically, in this case. So when this stream is executed, it inspects its own pipeline and compiles the SQL query, like this. And you recognize uh, all the statements from the stream. So you can view the database as streams. And you can try this, of course. This is open source. You can go to an initializer and down in a startup project, and you can try it on your databases. So you don't have to write SQL now anymore. You just use Java streams. So, fast uh, facts about uh, streams. They can merge, merge stream operators uh, into its source. Uh, of course, stream is just an interface, so there can be an infinite number of implementation of a stream. Uh, so, in fact, you can take this as an exercise. Uh, you can write a utility method called source-aware stream that takes a list and returns a stream that is really source-aware. That's a good uh, training example. And these streams are generally clever. They, they take care of parallelism. Uh, they inspect their own pipeline. They can prevent reuse uh, between invocation of intermediate operations. They have to handle close handlers. They have to be able to handle exceptions in lambdas. And they have to release potential resources that they have, such as a database connector or a file handler or something like that. And if you want to be really uh, cautious about this, you also can Im implement in-stream, long-stream, and double streams. Uh, so they are also smart. And they can vastly increase performance, both sequential and parallel, of course. Uh, interestingly, you can use these uh, streams with speedment also in parallel mode, so you can actually issue a parallel SQL query. That's very tricky to do uh, if you do it by yourself. 
Uh, how do we know what's happening under the hood? Uh, it's important that you can kind of trace what's going on uh, in your smart streams. And this again allows you to use a declarative code, clarity, without sacrificing performance. So you can really view a stream in a nice way, but it's really executed efficiently. So that's that. So now let's go on to holding terabytes of data in the JVM with no GC impact. This is a garbage collector uh, of an older version. Uh, it's also slow, like Java's garbage collector in general. So the problem is that we can, if we create a huge map like this, uh, in this case I will create a billion objects. Uh, I iterate from one to one billion, create a film, and collect it to map by extracting the film ID as key and actually entering the, the film itself into the map. So what's the problem with this? Well, we will get heap problems, of course, because we will create an enormous amount of objects. We'll not only create a film object, we will create a map entry object and an integer object and even more objects, depending on what kind of uh, map implementation we do. Each of those objects are subject to overhead and byte alignment. And if they live for a long time, they will be evaluated by a garbage collector several times. Uh, and it's also difficult to retrieve objects from this key value store, because what if I want to retrieve films that are longer than 60 seconds, for example? Uh, I don't want to iterate over all films, uh, so I go about and maybe create a tree map for each, for each field. So that will create, uh, well, if I have 100 fields, I will have 100 tree maps, each with additional objects inside. So this will create an explosion of, of objects. And the GC execution time as a function of objects is not linear. It's actually a quadratic dependency for most implementations of garbage collectors. So it looks like this. It's kind of a cocktail problem. When there are twice as many people on a cocktail party, you have to shake hands with four times the number of people, which is bad, especially in this flu time. So the solution is to, instead of having on the heap, uh, you can have an off heap. And that sounds very easy. But the advantage is that the, heap, the total memory size will be uh, much uh, lower because objects off heap can be stored more efficiently and the heap gets really small, which is good for garbage collection. So how do I allocate off heap memory? There are uh, in principle two ways. Oops, two ways. Uh, you can use byte buffers or you can use uh, unsafe. The three uh, first example are kind of byte buffers. Uh, you allocate directly off heap, or you can map it to an existing file, or you can map it to on heap memory. And the second is, is unsafe. And we will kind of compare the pros and cons between those uh, ways. So byte buffer is limited to uh, 2 to the power of 31 because it's used an int as an index. Whereas unsafe is uh, virtually unlimited because it's used a long as an address. And I say unlimited now because I regard 2 to the power of uh, 63 to be unlimited, at least with today's hardware. Uh, range checking, uh, we have that with byte buffer, but don't, not with unsafe. And uh, byte buffer has zero out guarantee. Uh, of course, there is a cost for that too. Whereas uh, with unsafe, you get what you get. Byte buffer is harder to free deterministically because you have to invoke something called a cleaner. Uh, you can, of course, wait for a garbage collector to free it, but then you might have the object hanging around for a long time. And byte buffer hash code is, uh, is really a, a trap. If you want to put your byte buffer in a map or a set, uh, they will become very slow uh, if you fill them up with data because they compute the hash code of the actual contents of the byte buffer. So you have to wrap it in another object. Let's talk about unsafe. Unsafe is unsafe to get. Because, yeah, okay, uh, because it's uh, different for different Java versions, how you get unsafe. Unsafe is unsafe to use because it doesn't have any range checking. And it's also unsafe not to use. For instance, if you get, forget to call free, uh, you will have a memory leak and that memory will be lost until your process dies. And it's also, and also unsafe future is unsafe. So I think they picked a pretty good name for that. And this is pure geek territory. So stay away from that. Uh, we can say performance like this. We have heap, off heap, and unsafe performance. They are kind of similar. It's not that super big difference. So you can write a hello unsafe 
program by this unsafe put byte zero zero, this will give you a segmentation fault, guaranteed to do that. So this shows how really unsafe uh, unsafe is. So consider using byte buffer over unsafe. And how do you communicate between the heap and off heap? Usually that's a serializer. So this serializer takes a certain type T and it can take that type and put it in the byte buffer and as a side effect modify its position. And there's also a corresponding deserialize method that will reconstruct your object from a byte buffer giving a position. So this shows how our previous point can be implemented. Uh, it takes a point and it can sort of put down int x and y and then when it deserializes it, it just gets int two ints and uh, use them in constructor. So it's quite uh, easy to write uh, a serializer. Of course, uh, the serializer is not thread safe because it has a side effect, whereas the deserialized is actually thread safe. Okay, uh, you can try this with Speedment. Uh, uh, has this built-in functionality. So I will show how you do that. So we, okay, so you, you have a slow application and you don't want that, so you, you connect to a database, give the credentials, and you will see here the data model of the database. You can scroll through and see tables and columns to the left-hand side. You click generate and it will generate all the serializers and projects and everything for you. And then you can use them as streams, like this. So it's very easy to, to start with the tool. And, yeah, in this example, you, you just write uh, a standard Java stream. And then you run it against the database, but that, that becomes slow still. You just add two lines of code, and instead of using the database, uh, we'll take a snapshot of the database, put it in an off-heap memory in the JVM, and all your queries in the stream will run against that snapshot instead of against the database. And that will, give you, that will be orders of magnitude faster. So you can uh, try that for yourself. So connect to the database, generate code, and then you can just use it. So table data is stored in, uh, in, in byte buffers. And serializers, they, they support something called in primitive deserialization. So you don't have to extract the entire object. You can also extract uh, columns directly. That gives you speed. And there's also indexes that are also of heap. So they provide a lot of operators here that you can use to really uh, find your uh, objects. And their complexity is largely independent of how much data you have. So they're all either order one or log n. So, and the data store itself, it's made up of all table and indexes. And it's an immutable snapshot of data because in that way it's, it's very performant and it's thread safe inherently. And you can create new snapshots by recycling old byte buffers. So if you do a change, you don't have to change all the byte buffers, maybe just one or two. And you can easily have terabytes of data. And it can fully decompose a stream into in JVM memory primitive operations. You can extract uh, contents of off heap very quickly. So in this first example here, uh, it will be complete in 160 nanoseconds, which is very fast. Uh, as a comparison, just accessing 64 bits memory is 100 nanoseconds. So this is the latency of, uh, of the stream with different JVMs. Again, this is Grail VM, which is very fast. And this is the real shocker, because it's uh, faster than just accessing 64 bits uh, memory. Okay, that takes us to the last point. My, I'm running out of time. So the thing is that you don't only can have data of heap, but you can do aggregations of heap too. Suppose you have a large number of measurements and they are grouped. Maybe you only have 100 groups, but you have a trillion of, of uh, measurements. Then you can create a large hat map, match, hash map, of course, but that's very costly uh, because you might not uh, want to use that all of the elements, just the aggregated value. And so the same idea is applicable here. Instead of using on a heap, you go off heap. And then you just read back the small result, which can be potentially a million times smaller. 
So in this example, we have a person with age, height, weight, gender, and salary. And you want to compute the average salary for with different age brackets. So then you can do this. This is kind of an interface between on heap and off heap. So uh, with Speedment, you can do it like this. You said that you have an ag aggregator that builds an age salary. And then for each person age, you use that as a key. And then for each salary, you compute the average using uh, the salary. And then the average is actually communicated back using this setter here. So that allows the entire uh, operation to be performed off heap. And then you can just use the aggregation in any stream. Uh, it just creates a collector, but the collector lives off heap. And you can even do computation, so you can have methods that return other methods. So in this way, you can build up a, a kind of tree of functions that are applied off heap. So in this case, we compute the BMI. So that's the kind of power and divide functions like that. So you can really compute uh, any statistical operation. So no garbage collecting pack, no memory wasted, uh, no heap limitation. And it's very efficient parallelism because they can build up different aggregators off heap and then the aggregation can be combined. So they can use separate threads. And they never materialize objects uh, from the stream. They can just extract values and put them off heap again. So that was the first presentation. So by that, I open up for questions that you might have. Yes? Uh, what happens when you exceed like, your memory limit? Mm? Yeah. Like yeah. Question is what happens when I exceed my memory? And I will get an out of memory error, just as we would get uh, in Java. Because we use byte buffers, and when we call for a new byte buffer, eventually that will fail, and I will get an out of memory error, just as we would do in normal case. Good question. Something more? Well, uh, since this is Sweden, I have prepared some questions. <laughs> so, how do I activate stack allocation? Uh, the answer is you don't have to do that. It's automatic, but you have to make sure that your actual JVM has a C2 compiler. For instance, if you run on, a dra on Raspberry Pi, most of the Java uh, JVM doesn't have a C2 compiler, but you can use Azul, for example, which actually has a, a C2 compiler for Raspberry Pi. Can I turn off stack allocation? Yes, but why would you ever want to do that? But you can do that uh, if you don't uh, enter the server mode, for example. Won't my program run much slower after restart? Of course it will. Uh, if you haven't warmed it up, it will be slower. And once it's warmed up, it will run faster. Uh, are the JDCode method list set map streams smart? No, they're not smart. They will evaluate uh, like a dump stream. They will e evaluate each and every element. But in some future, they might be smarter. We don't know. Are new Java stream operation take while supported? Yes, because uh, Java was shipped with these new uh, operations. They have default methods, which also works on uh, older implementation of streams. I think there is one. Yeah, want the new garbage collector like ZGC make the heap problem go away. Um, you might know that they are experimenting with new garbage collectors, which are really smart. And I think it's a good step forward, but it will only push the limit a bit further out to the right. And that's good but it will not solve the problem. Uh, it will only uh, prolong the wall, the distance to the wall you will hit eventually uh, with the quadratic dependency. Okay, so that was one Swedish question and six other questions. Thank you so much.